Tonight we're going to pick up where we left off last week. So turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 29, verse 14. Then Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. And Jacob stayed with him for a month. Now, we know from reading the story that Jacob actually stayed with Laban for 20 years. So why does verse 14 say that Jacob stayed with Laban for a month? Does anyone know? Well, it says that because that's how long Jacob stayed with Laban as a guest. You see, when Jacob went to Haran, he thought it would only be for a few days because that's what Mama told him. Look back at Genesis chapter 27, verses 43 through 45, and let's look at what Mama specifically said to Jacob. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise, flee to Haran to my brother Laban, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides, and he forgets what you did to him, that I shall send and get you from there. So as you can see, Jacob didn't intend to stay at Haran or in Haran for very long, just a few days. In fact, he thought that Mama was going to send a messenger any day now telling him it's time to come home. Esau's over it. He's no longer thinking about it. And when the messenger came, he thought that he would bring plenty of money and expensive gifts to be able to pay the bridal price and to give gifts to his future wife's family. Because if you remember, Jacob was supposed to find a bride while he was in Haran. So verse number 14 is telling us that Jacob stayed with Laban for a month as a guest. But after a month and no message from mama, Laban's hospitality runs out, which brings us to verse number 15. Then Laban said to him, just because you were a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now, you need to understand something about the Middle East and about hospitality. It was and it still is customary to appear hospitable even if you're being insincere. And a good example of this is the way that they haggled with each other. In fact, they still haggle in the Middle East just like they did 4,000 years ago. So let me explain how the haggling process worked in Jacob's day and then I'm gonna compare that to what Jacob, or I'm sorry, to what Laban is doing in verse number 15. The person selling something would open the negotiation by assuring the potential buyer that everything he has is his and just take what he wants. So if there was a merchant there and a customer came in, maybe to his booth or to his store or even his caravan, he would say, oh, my great friend, come on in. And he says, so good to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. And he would say, see my goods, I love you. Whatever you want, here it is, just take it. But he really didn't mean it. You see, from their, from their perspective, that's how you showed hospitality. Now, from our perspective today, if a person tells you to take whatever you want, but he really doesn't mean it, he's being insincere, disingenuous. But from their perspective, it's not insincere hospitality. It's just a part of the process. Because in their culture, a potential buyer would never, ever take whatever he wanted without purchasing it. Because that would be taking advantage of their hospitality, which is the height of rudeness. So they made the offer knowing that it wouldn't be accepted. Now here's where it's kind of interesting. As Americans begin to travel to the Middle East, places like Turkey, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, they don't do that to Americans. Because we don't understand the culture. So if you walked into one of their bazaars, one of their booths in the bazaar, or, or you went to a store, and they came out and said, oh, it's so good, you're from America, it's wonderful to have you. Just look around, see what there is. What's mine is yours. Just take what you want. Well, they know that Americans would do that because we don't understand their culture. So they don't do that to Americans anymore, but they do to their own people. So they make that offer knowing that it's never going to be accepted. Now, once they go through the formality of hospitality, the seller will then throw a price out because you've refused to just take it. Because you go, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that. Please, please, tell me what you want for this. And only after you've gone through this little bit here, he finally will just throw a price out, and you're insisting that he do that, so he does it. But it's always five to six times more than what the item is actually worth. Because both sides know that you're going to haggle over it. And they're going to continue to haggle with each other until they reach an agreement or until they realize that they cannot reach an agreement. Now, 
If you understand the haggling process, you'll understand what Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 14 says. Go ahead and turn there if you don't mind. Notice what Solomon wrote. The buyer haggles over the price saying, it's worthless. Then he brags about getting a bargain. And people, that's how it is over there. And likewise, the seller would complain that you're ripping him off, and then as soon as you walk out of the store after you paid him, he's now coming and bragging how he ripped you off. That's just part of their culture. And it's kind of interesting. I'll be honest with you. I know that our administration is not as stupid as they seem, our presidential administration. And the reason I say that is because I've been over to the Middle East, and I knew immediately when Egypt began their revolution who was going to take over. If you've been to the Middle East, it's the Muslim Brotherhood. You know they're not going to allow democracy. And yet they talked about democracy, but what's taking place? The Muslim Brotherhood has come into power. You know, they're now talking about Iran, and they're coming in, and they're, they're saying about Iran that they're a rational nation, you know, we'll be able to talk with them. People, let me just tell you, they're not. They're not. And if we don't understand that culture and the way they think, we're going to make some huge mistakes, and we're doing it. But I can't believe that we really don't know what we're doing. We just maybe feel like we don't know how else to do it, and that's just the public uh, face or the public uh, message we want to get out. But I want you to understand, this haggling process still works this way in the Middle East today. But here's my point, coming back to verse number 15. When Laban told Jacob, you shouldn't work for me without pay just because we're relatives, Tell me how much your wages should be. What he was doing was politely telling him that he wasn't going to entertain him indefinitely. In other words, the guest status was over. Finished. Done. And from now on, he needed to work for his room and board or he needed to go home. Now, from a Jew's perspective or anyone from the Middle East, they're reading this story and they get to verse 14 and they get to verse 15. They understand everything perfectly because they live in that culture. They knew exactly what was happening. But from a Western Christian perspective, we just go right over that. But actually what Laban is doing is he's coming in and saying, hey, no more free lunch. You said mama was coming. It's been a month. Mama's not here. This guest status can't go on forever. If you want to stay, you're going to have to work. Now, people, it's not that Jacob was lazy and hadn't been helping around the house and doing some of the chores, but he really wasn't under any obligation to do so. So he could basically do whatever he wanted whenever he wanted because he was a house guest. So what Laban was doing was putting him on notice in a very polite way that he could no longer stay as a guest. If he didn't want to leave and he wanted to stay, then he was going to have to go to work. Now, this was a wake-up call for Jacob. Because a month had come and gone, not counting the month that it took to get to Haran, and Mama still hadn't sent anyone to call him back home. So Jacob realized that there was a good chance that he might be there longer than he had originally thought. But what was even worse was that he had fallen in love with Rachel, one of Laban's daughters, but he hadn't brought enough bridal money to purchase a bride. Because in his mind, as beautiful as Rachel was, there was a good possibility that some male suitor was going to come along and he was going to snatch her away and mama would be too late. So he's in a world of trouble. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, not Leah, because Rachel was the pretty one. And the contrast between Rachel's beauty and Leah's ugliness is a key component of the story. Let me say that again. The contrast between Rachel's beauty and Leah's ugliness is a key component of the story. And you really won't understand everything that takes place at the end of this chapter and in the next chapter if you don't realize what's happening here. The contrast between Rachel's prettiness and Leah's ugliness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about both of the girls' features. Is that all right? Because the way Rachel acts and reacts is typical of a good-looking person with a lot of confidence. And the way that Leah acts and reacts is typical of a person with low self-esteem and a lack of confidence. So let's look at verses 16 and 17, and let's look at how both of these girls are described. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. But Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. 
not pretty, but beautiful. Now, you need to understand something about the Bible. The Bible always uses euphemisms for anything that's sexual. Adam knew Eve. The word knew means that he had sexual intercourse with her. When the Bible comes in and talks about certain things, it will always use these euphemisms, not only in the Old Testament, but the New Testament. When it's talking about marriage, it says marriage is holy in all things, and the marriage bed undefiled. Well, that word marriage bed, or that phrase, marriage bed, is actually translated from the Greek word kortea, which means, or actually we get our word koitis from. So if you would have translated it literally, it would have been sexual intercourse, but we don't do that. We use a euphemism because usually the Bible does that, but that's one instance it doesn't. Now, the reason I'm bringing all of these things up is because when the Bible says that she had a lovely figure, that's there for emphasis. She was a very beautiful woman with a body that rocked. You need to understand that. Okay, now as we look at these physical characteristics, I want you women to fight the urge to feel sorry for Leah and to hate Rachel. Because these de details that are part of the story are not put in there for you to feel sorry for Leah and for you to hate Rachel. They're put into the story so that you can understand the situation and you can understand why Rachel acts the way she does and reacts the way she does and why Leah acts the way she does and reacts the way she does. All right? So, it's also going to help us to understand why Jacob loved Rachel and hated Leah. Now, I know immediately when I say that, people say, ooh, I don't like it when you say that Jacob hated Leah, but what's interesting is that's exactly what the scriptures say. But it doesn't mean what we think it means, even though it says that in the original Hebrew, and I'll explain why when we get to that part, because you need to understand something about Hebrew. But the scriptures explicitly states that Jacob loved Rachel and he hated Leah. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis 29, Verses 30 through 31, we're kind of jumping ahead. I want you to notice what it said. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. Now, he went into, that's kind of a, again, euphemism. It's a nicer way of saying something socially unacceptable. He went into the bedroom with her. He knew her from a sexual way. And it says he loved also Rachel, Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated... He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now, as I said, this is a key component of the story. And if we don't look at this on a deeper level, we won't get the full impact of the story, and we won't understand why Jacob loved Rachel so much, but the Bible seems to indicate that he hated, and we'll find out what that means, Leah. And we also want to understand what happened and why it happened that way. So, let's talk about their birth order and their physical features. Leah, of course, was the oldest, it tells us that. And the only way that the Bible describes her was to say that she had weak eyes. Look at verses 16 and 17 again, and I want you to underline the word weak. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Re Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Now, the word weak is translated from the Hebrew word rach. I'm trying to do it right. It's kind of interesting, but they have the tendency in, in modern Hebrew, and we assume it's based upon ancient Hebrew, but it was a dead language. They revived it. But what's interesting is they row their R's, and they come in and, and combine that H with the K sound. If you want to say that uh, you want to eat lunch with someone, you would use the word to eat, lechol. If you want to know where a street is, it's lechol. Machah is tomorrow. Now, for us, we tend to spit when we say that. But this word weak is translated from the Hebrew word rach. I can't do it. Rach. And it means weak in the sense of small or scrawny. So what this is saying is that Leah didn't have the ability to open her eyes all the way. So they looked like little slits. And it appeared that the reason that she couldn't open her eyes all the way was because she didn't have the strength to do it. And that's what is meant by weak eyes. 
Now, listen to me because this is very important. What the Bible is describing is actually a medical condition. In other words, Leah had one of two things wrong with her eyes. She either had what is known as ptosis or she had dermatocalasis. Now, if you're in the medical profession and I mispronounce that, then you can come up and you can tell me later. Just tell me afterwards. I actually go to a place where I listen to the word and try to say it like it. But she either had what is known as ptosis or dermatocalasis. Now, let me explain what those two things are, and then I'm going to show you pictures so you'll see how it looks. All right? Ptosis is a drooping of the eyelids, or actually the upper eyelid, and it's caused by muscle weakness or paralysis. Now, it can occur in just one eye, or it can occur in both eyes. And since verse 17 says that Leah had weak eyes, plural, it means that it would have been in both eyes. Now, years ago, we had a lady in our church who had this medical condition, but it was only in one eye. She's not going to mind me mentioning her name because she's a good friend of mine, and uh, she's not uncomfortable about it. And many times she said, well, Alan, just go ahead and use me as an example. I said, are you sure about that? And she said, yeah. So we had a person in our congregation that actually had this medical condition, and her name is Janine Lindsay. How many of you know Janine Lindsay? What she has is ptosis, that upper eyelid is paralysis on one side. Now, let me show you some pictures of people with ptosis. Here's the first picture. It's of a little boy, and you really probably can't tell this very well, but notice his right eye. He wasn't bit by a mosquito. It's not that he was bit by a bug and it's swollen up and it's kind of partially closed. No, he has a condition that's referred to as ptosis. Now, I want you to notice, this one's kind of open here, but this one is like a small slit. This is a picture of ptosis occurring in both eyes. See this? He has it in both eyes. Notice how they're not full eyes. It is slits. And it looks like he doesn't have the strength to open it up. Now, you need to understand the cause of ptosis. Either the muscle in the upper eyelid is weak or there's paralysis. If there's paralysis, there is nothing they can do about it. This is the way they look all the time. Now, let me show you two more pictures of it, one with both eyes and one with only one eye. Here's both eyes, another picture. She's actually been able to have this surgically corrected because hers wasn't paralysis. Hers was simply weak eyes, so they were able to come in, strengthen those things up, do a little bit of surgery. But notice how she looked all the time. Does she look sleepy? She looks kind of, mm, and it's like, open your eyes. She couldn't open her eyes until she had the surgery, and this is what it looks fixed. Here's another picture of just one eye. He has it severely. His is not something that can be corrected. And the reason it can't be corrected is because his isn't, isn't a weak muscle, it is a paralysis. Now, maybe they've, they've uh, actually made some improvement or they've learned something where they can come in and do it, but uh, the material that I've read up to this point, they couldn't correct that. Now, can you see why Leah would have been described as having weak eyes? That's exactly what ptosis looks like. It looks like you don't have the strength to open your eyes fully or all the way. Now, the other condition that scholars think that Leah might have had is called dermatocalasis. Dermatocalasis is an excess of skin in the upper eyelids. So what happens is the upper eyelids actually cover the upper eyelashes and half of the eye. So it gives the appearance of a weak eye uh, look. Let me show you two pictures of dermatocalasis. Here's the first one. She's had surgery because basically what it is is just excess, excessive skin, too much skin on the upper eyelids. So what happens is it droops down. The way that you can always tell if someone has dermatocalasis rather than ptosis, and dermatocalasis, you can't see the upper eyelashes. Now notice at the top of the picture, do you see the eyelashes? No, because there's too much skin. So it actually comes down and it loops over the eyelashes and the eyelashes are underneath it. And the reason you surgically correct it today is because you know how all the sleep gets in your eyelashes. Well, to clean theirs out and to keep from infections out, they've got to pull it up and be able to clean it really well. So she's come in and she's had surgery. They've cut that out, and here's what she looks like now. But 4,000 years ago, you couldn't do that. Here's another example of dermatocalasis. 
he doesn't seem to have it as bad, but if you notice, you can't see the upper eyelashes. Now, here's what you need to remember, especially as you go through the story. The term weak eyes describes her physical appearance, and it refers to a medical condition. It does not refer to eyesight. Some of you have study Bibles. Some of you have layman commentaries or expository commentaries, and it will say things like, she possibly had weak eyesight. No, 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 no. This isn't saying that she's nearsighted. She's legally blind. It's not saying that at all. It doesn't mean tender or delicate. If you've got the King James Version or you read the NLT, it's going to say tender, it's going to say delicate. It does not mean that. It refers to her physical appearance, and it means that she either had ptosis or dermatocalasis. But more likely, she had ptosis. Now, at that time, and in their culture, Leah's medical condition would have been an embarrassment to the family. How many of you support the smile train? How many of you know what the smile train is? It basically goes to uh, children in third world countries that have uh, a cleft palate and they fix it. Because in those cultures, it's very embarrassing to have that. And they're ostracized from society. They really don't get to participate. So when you fix that, you're literally changing their life. And no, that's not one of the ministries we'll be talking about at the Jenner's Church. But anyways, I want you to understand in this culture, her medical condition would have been very embarrassing to the family and it would have made it almost impossible to arrange a marriage for her. And remember, the oldest must marry first. So that explains why Leah was still single and Rachel wasn't betrothed. Laban couldn't arrange a marriage for Rachel until Leah was betrothed. And it was all because she had weak eyes. But that was the reason it was impossible for him to arrange a marriage. But it also explains why Rachel was a shepherd and Leah wasn't, even though Leah was the oldest. Last week, Clayetta Ridenauer came up to me and she said, so if Leah was the oldest and you reached the age of 14 and you needed someone because of your flock, you would use a woman. Why wasn't Leah the shepherd? Well, Laban wanted Rachel out in public and his hope was that Rachel's beauty and lovely figure would attract male suitors, and with polygamy being an acceptable practice, maybe someone would be willing to marry Leah as long as he got Rachel also. So Rachel wouldn't go out in public very often, while Leah was, or, or Rachel would go out in public very often, and Leah would have to stay at home. Now, we're going to see, as we read through the story, how this medical condition affected Leah's self-esteem and personality when we get to the end of the chapter. She's going to start having children. And she names her children interesting names that have interesting meanings. And then we're going to get into chapter 30, and we're going to find out that she quits conceiving. But it's, the reason she quits conceiving is very interesting. And it all goes back to this rivalry between Rachel and Leah and to this victim mentality and this overconfidence in this entitlement uh, personality that Rachel has, all right? So trust me, their physical features not only affected their self-esteem and their personality, but also affected their actions and their reactions, and Jacob is going to be caught in the middle. Lee is going to feel like Jacob hates her, and we'll understand what it means by hate, because in the way the Hebrews meant it, he did hate her. And you're going to see why he loved Rachel and how he's caught in the middle between the two. Now, look at verse number 18. We've been 14, 15, 16, 17. We're moving on to verse 18. Jacob was in love with Rachel and he said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Now, remember, let's keep in mind that Laban had politely informed Jacob that he could no longer stay as a guest. So he, if he wanted to stay, then he needed to go to work for Laban, which begs the question, how much to pay him? Because after all, he is a family member, but he needs to earn his own way, and Laban's a greedy fellow. We already saw that when Abraham's servant came to get a wife for Isaac. We saw how Laban reacted 
We saw too when Jacob came and Rachel came running home and said that her cousin had come. He remembered what happened. The reason he ran running out there is because he's a greedy person. And now that he has politely informed him that if you want to stay, you need to work, it begs the question, how much is Laban going to have to pay? So Laban begins the negotiation just the way they always did it in the Middle East. He begins by asking Jacob to tell him what he thought a fair wage would be. Because he's expecting from that point, we'll begin to haggle. And he would have the upper hand. Because Jacob has told him everything. Jacob has told him that he can't go home. And the reason he can't go home is because Esau wants to kill him. So mama said, come up here. And so he's basically going to say it, but in a very polite way, that if you want to stay, then you need to go to work. What do you think is a fair wage? And they would begin to haggle. And that's what, what Laban was expecting to happen. But Jacob surprised him. Instead of asking for wages, he says... I want to work for Rachel. So he offered to serve Laban for seven years in lieu of paying the bridal price. Now remember, you had to pay the bridal price. Seven years, people, is what he offers. Now, most of us read this and we go, seven years, that's a long time. But we really don't realize what a great deal this was for Laban. In fact, to understand how great a deal it is, there's no haggling. It's kind of like, whoa, I'll take it before you think. You know what I'm saying? Laban's expecting there to be haggling. Jacob says, I don't want pay. Room and board, and I'll serve you for seven years if you give me Rachel. No haggling. Wow. Now, why was this such a great deal for Laban? Well, let me explain why. Basically, there are two reasons. Number one, it's because seven years was an un unbelievably high offer, and let me explain why I say that. The average bridal price at that time was about 25 shekels. A high bridal price. Let's say the girl is a knockout. She's a hard worker, great personality. Everyone thinks she has wonderful character. A high bridal price was about 35 shekels. And 50 shekels was, a, was about the highest bridal price a man could or would ever pay. In fact, it was actually considered to be an absurd amount. If you paid that bridal price, usually it's because you got caught doing something you shouldn't have been doing. Now, where did I get this information? I'm getting this information from G.R. Driver and J.C. Miles' book, The Babylonian Laws, Volume 1, Pages 470 and 471. I give you that because every once in a while I have someone come up and say, where do you get that information? So that's where I get that information of what they normally paid for the bridal price, what was considered a high bridal price, and every once in a while someone was forced to pay 50 shekels. Now, the Bible supports this. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 28 through 29, and you'll see why it was considered to be an absurd price and why you were usually in trouble when you had to pay that much. It says, if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and has sexual intercourse with her, and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. Now, you need to understand something. This is the penalty. This is the punishment. You have violated a man's daughter, so the man who violated the man's daughter is going to receive the maximum punishment. In other words, he's going to have to pay the highest or maximum bridal price, which was considered to be absurd, but you're the one that goofed up. So not only are you going to have to pay the bridal price, but you're going to have to pay on top of that because you've offended his character. You've ruined the reputation of his family. So can you see why 50 shekels was considered to be an absurd price? Not only that, he could never divorce her. And the reason he could never divorce her is because this is the punishment. You should have never done that. Let it not be done in the nation of Israel. Now, how much was a shekel worth in Jacob's day? Well... A common laborer was paid one shekel a month. So it would take 
four years and two months to earn 50 shekels. Four times 12 is 48 plus two, 50 shekels, one shekel a month. So that's the equivalent of four year salary. Actually, technically, a four year salary plus two months. So to offer to work seven years for Rachel was the equivalent of paying 84 shekels. Did you catch that? Offering to work seven years. How many months are in a year? 12. Seven times 12 is 84. You received a shekel, plus your room and board as a common laborer, a month. He was willing to pay 84 shekels for Rachel. Now people, that is 34 shekels above and beyond what was considered the maximum bridal price, which was also considered an absurd amount. So Laban was getting a great deal from a financial perspective. So when he throws it out to begin the haggling process, so what would be a fair wage? And he says, no money. Room and board like you would a common labor, but instead of receiving a shekel, I'll work seven years for Rachel. And he doesn't even haggle. Oh my gosh, Jacob is a fool. But anyways, Laban was getting this great deal from a financial perspective. The second reason it was such a great deal for Laban was because he was getting two workers for the price of one. You see, Jacob was, wasn't going to get to marry Laban's daughter until after he worked for Laban for seven years. Remember, he has to work the first seven years before he gets to marry, which means that she's not his wife for seven years. Which tells us that the daughter is going to get to continue working for her father during that seven year period. Whereas if Jacob had just paid him the bridal price, she would have immediately stopped working for her father because she would have had her own family and she would have started working for Jacob or her husband. But since she didn't become Jacob's wife until after the seven years, she continued to work for her father. So Laban was receiving two workers for the price of one, and it doesn't even come due for seven years. Now, is everyone able to follow my reasoning? Everyone following that? Good, because it's important to realize that Laban was getting a great deal with Jacob's offer. And then when we get to the tricky part, which you know is coming, we're gonna see how this all goes down. Now, let me ask you a question. Why in the world did Jacob make such a generous offer? I want you to think about that. We know that Jacob was in his 40s. I've proven that to you. He is a smart, cunning man. He's learned the family business. He's prospered his father Isaac. I mean, when Isaac got to the age, remember, 60 years old, when the twins are born. So when he gets to his old age, he's ready to bless them. It's kind of interesting. He's, almost, he, he's 100 years old, and he's almost blind, so he was taking care of the family business. Jacob was. So Jacob is not this impulsive type of person. In fact, when his mother told him, you go put on Esau's clothing and you go in there and you pretend to be, I, or you pretend to be Esau and be, get, get Esau's blessing, what did he say? Oh, no, 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 mom. That will bring a curse upon me. You see, he thought things through. So why in the world would he make such a generous offer? I mean, think about it. If 50 shekels was considered to be an absurd amount to pay as a bridal price, and the reason it was considered an absurd price was because it was the equivalent of four years' salary, actually four years and two months. Now, if that's the case, why would Jacob offer to work seven years in lieu of the bridal price? Why didn't he, why didn't he offer to work only three years? Three years is how many, uh, how many shekels? There's 36 months, you get one shekel a month. So that would have been the equivalent working three years of 36 shekels. Now remember, 25 is the average bridal price. 35 is what? The high price. 50 is absurd. You gotta be in trouble to pay that. So why did he say, she's beautiful, she's a knockout. I'll pay the high price. I'll work for you for three years. Why didn't he do that? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because he wanted to marry the youngest daughter, not the oldest. And Jacob thought if he paid twice the amount of the normal bridal price, Laban would allow him to marry Rachel 
even though Leah wasn't married. Because after all, he's offering to pay double the bridal price and a high bridal price to top it off. So he's paying the price that Laban would have received for Leah, plus he's paying the bridal price for Rachel. Think about this. Seven years is, is 84 shekels. If he paid the high price for not just Rachel, but also Leah, he would be paying 70, 35 and 35. But in his mind, by doing this, it would be okay for Rachel to get married before Leah did. Because after all, Le Laban is going to be getting paid as if Leah was getting married also. Now, does everyone understand what I'm saying? Good. But here's what's interesting. Laban never officially agrees to do that. Not technically. Does he imply? Yes. He implies that that's acceptable and that he's agreeing to this. But technically, he never did agree to it, and we're going to see why I say that next week. And Jacob is going to learn a very hard lesson, which we'll look at next week.